Hi, Betsy. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm doing really well. How are things over there? I can't, I can't complain. Uh, <laughs> we're actually in the same town as it happens, but but we're probably a mile away or so. Okay, um, sure. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available in both streaming video and audio podcast. You are Betsy Levy Pollock. Your your academic byline is Elizabeth Levy Pollock, uh, but you're, right. you're a professor of psychology and public affairs at uh, Princeton, and we're going to talk about what is, uh, I guess, sometimes called the psychology of tribalism. I may ask you how you feel about that term, but in any event, the psychology that is behind uh, group conflict and group tension. Um, but first, I have to congratulate you. You Only a couple of weeks ago, you learned that you had won one of these MacArthur Awards, the so-called Genius Grants, right? That's right. Was that a good feeling? <laughs> it was a it was a mind boggling feeling, uh, followed by a good one, followed by a uh, one that you know uh, created a lot of nerves. But uh, it, it ended up being a field wide celebration. Um, I heard from a lot of psychologists, and and it was it was a lot of fun. Well, that's. You know, so and and it's not one of these things where you have an idea that you're in the running, right? It's not like there are nominees and it's not like the Nobel Prize where it's kind of understood who's in the running. This just comes right out of the blue, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And it, it definitely came out of the blue for me. I was just, you know, having an ordinary September day in my office when I got a call on my cell phone and, you know, no one calls me on my cell phone anymore. So I picked it up mostly out of just surprise mm -hmm. that uh, <laughs> someone was actually wanting to talk to me uh, by voice. <laughs> So, so yeah, and then that's how I learned. And uh, after instructions not to tell anyone but one person for a while. So I had some time to let it sink in. Wait, they said you can pick one person to tell but nobody else? That's right. That's right. And huh. you have to, of course, swear that person to secrecy. So uh -huh. it's very cloak and dagger for a little while. <laughs> huh. Congratulations. Thanks. It's great because, you know, one of... Uh... One of life's great, great burdens is having to walk around being the only one who realizes that you're a genius, you know. And <laughs> believe me, that's no picnic. But, uh, but now you can just, everyone knows. So that's good. Saves you a lot of, saves you a lot of time. My secret's out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, you study, uh, and I, I assume this is a, a major reason that you got the award. You have an impressive body of work in the field of... Uh, you know, again, group conflict, broadly construed, ranging from, you know, bullying people of certain sexual orientations all the way to civil war. Um, and, you know, this is particularly relevant now in, in America because of all the political polarization um, and people trying to figure out what to do about it. And you, unlike a lot of people, have actually tried to do things about it. You've done you've done impressive uh, field studies actual interventions trying to change attitudes and trying to see what works. Um, and so I want to talk about some of the things you've done and then maybe come back to the subject of contemporary America, Donald Trump, and so on. Um, and why don't we start with this this thing you did in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, mm. right? This is a the one involving the, the soap opera. Uh, the, it was a radio soap opera. That's right. So, so why don't you set the scene, first of all? This is kind of, in a sense, post-conflict Congo, although I think there was still some conflict going on. But, but why don't you remind us of the political context first? Right, right. Um, Democratic Republic of Congo, when I was working there on this project, this was in 2006, 2007. Um, it's one of these so-called post-conflict states that now I think the World Bank likes to call a fragile state, um, where there's still ongoing conflict. Um and uh, um, even if it might not be official, it, it, it was pretty constant. We, there would be multiple days during our field work where, you know, we couldn't leave. We couldn't go um, to another town to do interviews because it was just not safe enough. The U.N. was there and constantly monitoring. Um, but I'd actually set the scene um, uh, even a little bit wider because I started this research after working just across the way um, in Rwanda, across that border. This is um, where I was working. It was in the Eastern um, Democratic Republic of, of Congo or DRC. Um, and, you know, you can literally just walk across that border with your passport um, and enter um, from the, you know, sort of dusty, turbulent, uh, um, 
you know, uh, exciting um, life of uh, um, Goma, uh, one of the cities on the border, into very orderly, clean, uh, post-genocide Rwanda. And I had been already studying a radio program there, uh, which was a radio soap opera, uh, kind of a Romeo and Juliet story, um, that had been serving for a number of years as a kind of um, giant um, literary metaphor for um, listeners, Rwandan listeners, about um, ethnicity and uh, and conflict in Rwanda. So Rwanda... It was Romeo and Juliet in the sense that this was a romance that crossed uh, ethnic bounds. Exactly. Um, and in the radio soap opera, the words Hutu and Tutsi were never used. Um, you know, uh, Hutus had... Uh, uh, on a mass scale, participated in the slaughter of, of, of Tutsi um, during the civil war and genocide, during the genocide mostly, um, but the, there was a civil war obviously leading up to that. Um, and um, following um, Tutsi takeover of, of the country and, and the end of the genocide, um, all speech about ethnicity had been outlawed. Mm -hmm. And so um, you you could actually you know be taken to prison for talking about the terms Hutu and Tutsi, and so we were studying this this fictional story about two villages. There's a, a love interest and and so forth, and it had been explicitly written um, by an NGO with Rwandan writers um, to get people to think about what are the causes of violence, how does it escalate, and what can be done in, in the aftermath. Um, it was a huge hit, first of all, and um, in part because it had really captured people's attention and imagination, I was really able to get a lot out of the study that I had structured along with the um, the release of this new radio soap opera. And um, anyway, what I learned in, in Rwanda was that um, uh, people didn't um, take away lessons from the radio program per se, uh, in that they weren't really picking up what the radio program was putting down. They weren't coming away saying, I have learned something about how violence escalates. And you yeah. knew this, you knew this kind of anecdotally from talking to people. So, so what we did was we actually set up, um, the study that I'm referring to was, um, uh, a very carefully structured randomized controlled trial, much in the same way as we would test a new drug, um, of this radio program. So we were taking um, the program out to be played um, to uh, Rwandans in different communities. Um, uh, some that had been randomly, randomly assigned to listen to this radio soap opera about reconciliation, and others were randomly assigned to listen to a radio soap opera about women's health and uh, HIV. So they're all getting this experience of like gathering together as a community, which is basically how a lot of people listen to the radio in, um, in these kinds of places. Um, and they were listening to this dramatic, you know, uh, soap opera with educational messages. Um, but the educational messages really differed. Um, so we were interested in, you know, did the, are the people listening to this reconciliation radio program, do they have different ideas now about violence and um, dissent from uh, authoritarian orders to violence um, than do the other people who are pretty comparable, but they were assigned to listen to these other programs. So, um, so when I say that they weren't really picking up what we were putting down, um, they weren't um, what you would think of as good students. They weren't saying, you know, um, you have illustrated for me that violence accumulates slowly. They had just come out of living this. And they said to us things like, no, no, no violence does not, you know, um, uh, build slowly. When the violence came, it was like a sudden rain. Um, and uh, no, 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 I don't believe that intermarriage, you know, reduces, uh, you know, as you put it, tribalism or, or intergroup hatred. Um, I watched, you know, Hutu men kill their Tutsi wives. How can you tell me that? Um, so it wasn't effective in that sense, but so it wasn't, there was no attitudinal change that you tried to study that showed that the soap opera had done any good. I mean, it sounds like you studied more kind of explicit, almost self-awareness of change as much as kind of subtler manifestations of attitude toward other ethnicities. Is that fair? Or, but, 
That's pretty fair. I mean, we weren't always saying things like, what did the radio program teach you? Okay. We were just really just asking questions about intermarriage, about okay. uh, violence and so forth. And, and they were, they were resisting, but, but it is true. I mean, sometimes people would kind of like, um, step out of that context of the survey and say, look, I, I just listened to this radio program. I know what it was doing. And like, mm -hmm. I don't, I'm, I don't buy it. Right. Right. So it was, uh, they, they knew it was at some level propaganda. And I don't want to use a loaded no, term, but I, they knew that the I, idea was to change attitudes and, and not, and nothing you tried to measure showed that it had been successful. Is that right? So there was one way in which it was quite successful. And, um, it is uh, maybe a subtle distinction, um, so I'll try to, to not use any psychological jargon. Basically, people change their ideas about what other people thought. So um, a good example would be, I don't really think that intermarriage helps to preserve the peace, um, but right now in Rwanda, um, what I'm taking from this sh very popular show is that lots of people do think this. Lots of people think we should let our sons and daughters uh, marry one another. So it gets back to this old adage about the media, which is that it doesn't tell us what to think, but it tells us what other people are thinking. And this, this might just be like, you know, sort of an interesting fact about media influence, except for the fact that we also did observe behavior change. So when we went into these communities, we, we did these, you know, um, exercises with them where we would, you know, give the community a common resource and see how they divided it or if they divided it. Um, in many cases, you know, people would give it to the local authority and let them decide what to do with it. Um, what we were observing is that alongside of this change in, in what I would call a social norm, your, your perception of what other people believe, um, were these changes and positive changes in behavior where um, they were more likely to share things among themselves, um, to divide things up equally. Um, and, and also we're more likely to uh, dissent against local authority. And, and that's actually, that was a goal here. So, I mean, in the United States right now, we don't necessarily think of um, uh, argumentation as something that we're lacking, but, um, but this was actually, you know, a goal in, in post-genocide Rwanda where people were very concerned with, you know, how authorities, um, encouragement to participate in the violence could have been so effective, right? Um, and when you talk about the sharing, uh, the increased sharing, was this a study where you, did you do the SALT thing in this study, or is that only the DRC, where you actually... That was in the DRC, okay. actually. So, so, so the observed sharing, I mean, two questions, what, what was it, and were they sharing it only within their group, uh, or were they sharing it across bounds? So um, certain groups that we were in were pretty homogenous. So sharing meant more of, um, you know, if, if, if we were in a community where it was mostly Tutsi, it wasn't cross-ethnic sharing. But there were other communities we were in where it was heterogeneous, and, and, and we saw that um, they were sharing even within those heterogeneous communities. Uh, what we used actually was... Um, we presented the community with a big stereo. And we basically said, you know... It's, it's a symbolic gift and it's one that's meant to continue your experience listening to the radio together. Um, you know, we are leaving. We're not going to be coming back to your community anymore. Here is this gift. You can't, you know, divide it up physically and each take it back to your home. So how are you going to manage it? Um, how are you going to share it? How are you going to use this to listen? And um, the, the, the pattern that we observed is in the communities where they hadn't been listening to this reconciliation program, uh, what typically happened would be that one person would say, and this was in a pretty naturalistic setting. We, we had sort of put away our notebooks. We were having sort of a celebratory thing at the end of our time in the community. Um, one person would say, um, I think that we should give it to the local authority and he can decide what to do with it. Um, and, and people would vote in the, sort of decision would end there. Um, in the groups that we were working with for this reconciliation program, um, the same uh, suggestion usually uh, led off the discussion. In other words, you know, let's give it to the local authority. Um, but then someone else might raise their hand and say, wait a second, why are we giving it to him? He hasn't been part of these, you know, listening um, uh, events that we've been going to. Let's give it to a woman. They're much more responsible. They can help us, you know, decide how to share it with each other. And then and some debate would uh, ensue. And it wasn't anarchy. It was just, you know, a more robust debate about 
um, cooperating to to share this this mm-hmm. common resource. Um, so I, I had to uh, manage expectations. I was working with this NGO that was producing the radio program, and they were saying, you know, how are things going in the field? And I said, oh, great. You know, they're arguing a lot more about this, this common resource. <laughs> that's good, right? And I said, yeah, I think so. I mean, that's, that's, you know, dissent is something that you're teaching. So, um, But, but on, I, ba- on balance, were you disappointed at, at, the, uh, at the impact you saw across the board from the, so, from the radio show? I, I was I was very encouraged and intrigued. Uh, what I care most about, you know, I'm a behavioral scientist. So at the, at the end of the day, I'm I'm really interested in what are the mental processes that accompany real behavior in this world. So mm-hmm. not, I didn't really have any particular attachment to it's got to be about your values or your beliefs. Um, if it's going to be that when you perceive that other people value something, you're going to go along with it. Um, that's a very interesting phenomenon and. I thought it also made sense because it seemed like the flip side of what had happened during the genocide. It it, it made a lot of sense to me. Um, the way a lot of people talked about the mass violence was um, uh, not that violence was driven by their personal beliefs. Many of them said, like, look, we've got to tell you, before the genocide, we there was a lot of discrimination against Tutsi, but I didn't have any personal animus toward Tutsi mm-hmm. people or my, my neighbors. I mean, we, we played you know, soccer together, we, you know, um, shared meals together. Um, but once the violence came, it was like the law, you know, everybody was doing it. Um, you were expected to join in. And that's what I would think of as a, as a psychologist, as a, as a social norm, um, these expectations, um, that you should do something, um, this perception that, wow, this is really typical. It's not a big deal. Everybody's participating in the violence. Um, so that sort of that started to shape my um, my uh, goal of trying to figure out more about how these uh, perceptions of what's normative, how how those are um, formed. Um, so I thought that I had this really interesting study suggesting how mass media can play a big role um, mm-hmm. in the formation of of the normal um, mm-hmm. and. And, and so what I did in the DRC next was an extension okay. of that. So there, I gather, you asked the question, well, what would happen if you supplemented a soap opera like this, a radio soap opera, with a, a discussion, which I guess aired after the soap opera in at least some of the communities, mm-hmm. uh, and where in which you explicitly drove home or at least aired the kind of possible morals of the story about whatever inclusiveness and, you know, perspective taking, putting yourself in the shoes of the other and so on. Right. And uh, I gather there you found, and I guess this is bad news for me, somebody who runs this website where we discuss things, but you found <laughs> discussion, <laughs> discussion doesn't necessarily work miracles, right? Right. Right. The reason I was so interested in discussion is because, um, you know, I, I had this one study where we found that media changed your perception of the social norm. And that was important because it changed behavior. Well, I wasn't subscribing to any sort of miracle hypodermic needle theory of the media. It's not that you listen to the media and it just injects these ideas into you. Um, So I thought, well, people got this social proof of um, the popularity of this program's ideas because they were sitting together. They were listening to the program together. We have lots of records of what happened in those communal listening sessions. People would, you know, exclaim. People would, you know, tisk when, you know, uh, one of the villains was Mm -hmm. going about their villainry, right? So they're getting all this social feedback. And when we went to go study a similar program in in, uh, DRC, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to try to really, um, amplify that Mm -hmm. social proof to, to also put on air, um, a a short companion program that, um, that reinforced this idea that lots of people are listening and lots of people approve of this idea and want to discuss these ideas. Um, and can can I just interject that the observation you just made seems interesting to me because it suggests that well, it suggests there's a difference between watching something in the company of people and not in terms of the influence it's going to have. Because it sounds like when the, when the soap opera succeeded in eliciting 
the response it wanted, like whether it's, oh, this is unjust or this is morally bad or something, that the effect was possibly amplified by observing it have that effect in others. In other words, it, it, right? So Absolutely. that's just an interesting, that's just an interesting thing because uh, I mean, and it's consistent with what I think you said earlier, which is that the, 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 if not the main role of the media in these places, in these contexts, uh, then at least a, a fundamental role is to convey to people what other people are thinking, what the prevailing norms are. That's exactly rather than to just give explicit instruction. Okay, so with that yeah. interruption, you can uh, go ahead. No, that that's a really astute observation. That that is, I think, you know, very important, and it applies to lots of different types of mass media. Right? We know how many like something got, we know how many eyeballs, you know, roughly are on the ads during the Super Bowl. We have a sense of like what the audience is and how large it is. So that that matters, I think. So so in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I it's not straightforward and you can totally appreciate this to design a talk show um to just have it be um one that uh highlights that you know many people agree or many people are are thinking about this, people are going to just bring up their opinions and, and they might um, they might be consistent with what the, the soap opera is is trying to say and they and they might be inconsistent. So this this particular um, talk show, um, you know, we had to overcome a lot of um, logistical challenges, which is that people can't call in. We we weren't able the environment was the technological environment was such that people weren't going to be able to call in to talk with a host. So we had a pre-recorded talk show with, um, you know, people writing in letters and, uh, and then the, the host would essentially pose a few questions to get people talking in their own homes about the, um, the subject of the, of the radio soap opera, which was now about the context of conflict in, uh, the DRC. And, you know, so so basically, what we found it was um, one of my first, you know, big failures in um, uh, in terms of you know my my uh, ultimate goal of trying to to help this you know NGO promote peace is that um, people who have been encouraged to talk about the themes actually felt um, uh, a lot more um, prejudice and um, and and resentment and anger against. Um, the groups they had a problem with in their own locality. The, the context of DRC is really complicated because there are many different groups at conflict with each other. And, and so it really depends on what particular location you're in. Yeah, so this is compared to the people who didn't hear the talk show at all that, that came after the... That's right. So in certain areas, and this is a small study, but in certain areas of, of DRC, um, people only heard the talk show. So this is relative to someone who just heard the talk show and wasn't encouraged in a very specific way to debate its themes. Mm -hmm. The people who were encouraged to debate its themes um, responded more negatively on survey questions that um, my survey team had. Uh, we fanned out throughout these areas and um, randomly selected people who were living there to answer questions about um, the amount of resentment they had um, toward other groups um, that they didn't belong to and, and groups they were actively in conflict with. So along at least one dimension, uh, not only did talking about things not help, it actually seems to have hurt. Um, and, but, yeah, and there was another, another thing you, you measured as well, right? Here we come back to the salt that I alluded to earlier, where you actually um, uh, gauged willingness to share and I think in principle share across ethnic lines, right? How, how did, the, how did this work? That's right. So, um, again, I really wanted to try to set up a situation in, I could, in which I could observe some cross group behavior, which was difficult because we were visiting people's homes and the conflict is such that, you know, we're not going to be able to bring people together and observe how they interact. So what we did, I took a page out of, um, uh, many economists' tool books. Uh, economists and, and now some um, anthropologists as well have been using these abstract, what they call behavioral games, um, and uh, asking people to play and participate in these games that have some very simple rules. So one type of game is called the dictator game, and basically you're given an endowment, 
and uh, that could it's usually money, but it could be really anything. And then you're you're told, um, here's another person. Um, you can give as much or as little as you want to them. That's it. Those are the rules. Um, and uh, you know, according to you know standard rational actor theory from economics, you should give zero. You should just maximize your profits. And it's been puzzling economists for a while that. It turns out you go all over the world and people usually don't um, give zero. In fact, many people split their endowment in half. I'll, I'll give you $5 if I've gotten 10. Um, and then it's created this whole industry of people being interested in like, when does the context change that? So if you're living in a communist state, um, you know, are you likely to give less? And, and in fact, that turns out to be one finding. So different government structures and, um, you know, uh, marketplace structures will influence how generous people are with strangers. And so I wanted, I thought, all right, let's, let's see what they do here. So, um, the, there are a couple of twists that we used. Um, we didn't give out money. We gave a bag of iodized salt measured very precisely. Um, and then gave the salt, which is a, it's a, quite a commodity in, in uh, DRC where people get non-iodized rock salt at the marketplace. The actual iodized salt is pretty expensive and so valuable. And we said to them, um, <clears throat> remind me, because there were so many different groups and it was hard to know who exactly was whose mortal enemy in any one interview. We said, you know, remind me, you told me at the beginning of the survey that you have a particular problem with a group. Who, who was that again? They'd say, you know, it, it, it's the, um, you know, the Batutsi or something like this. And we'd say, yes. So we're actually, um, uh, as a thanks for participating in this survey, we're going to give you this bag of salt. Um, but we should add that um, we are taking up collections um, for uh, a group who is in need in this area. And so if you'd like, you can give much or as little of this salt as part of this collection we're taking up for this group in need. And they'd say, you know, who, who is the group in need? And we'd say, well, unfortunately, it is actually the Batutsi. Um, but, uh, you know, again, you're free to give as much or as little as you want. And one thing that was really interesting about what we found is that people did give. Uh, people were quite generous. Um, and, um, and that's just, first of all, pretty stunning fact about, um, humans is that, you know, even in this context, people gave, um, but then I could compare how much people in the talk radio areas where they received the talk show on, on their, um, local antennas, how much they gave as opposed to, um, how much the soap opera people gave. People who had been exposed to these talk shows gave less salt. And um, what we did, as opposed to what a lot of um, economists and others do, is we also asked people why they gave, how much they gave. We wanted to know what, what was the meaning of this gift, because it is a little strange. Um, many of them ended up telling us that, telling us that um, their donations were actually meant as a, sort of, um, a warning or a, um, a negative sign to these groups. So, um, in other words, they would say things like... Um, I want you to take this salt to them and tell them to get out of here. You know, like these are not mm. their ancestral lands. Um, I want you to take this as part of a message to them. Like here is your salt and now leave us alone. And so even when people were giving it, it wasn't exactly a message of peace. Um, and, uh, and, th and this, this association of the giving with a kind of a negative motivation was more pronounced if they had heard the talk show in addition to the yeah. soap opera. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, um, so in every way, <laughs> um, talking we, was we bad. The evidence that the talking was not a productive use, and and so, you know, you can step back and and compare, you know, across the border. Um, well, what are the differences? I mean, obviously, there, there's active fighting going on as you're asking people to discuss the conflict. That's a lot different than. Um, a radio soap opera that's getting people to reflect on a quite horrible and violent period that is actually in their past. There was a lot of security in Rwanda when we were um, watching these natural discussions unfold, right? Um, you know, and, and also, you know, talk show formats are different from just the conversation that bubbles up after uh, an episode of some show has ended, right? So the conversations that come up in, you can imagine, your own family as you reflect on shows that touch on really politically hot topics in our own society. Um, that's different than, you know, a very structured question that's posed as part of a talk show format when 
it's almost more of a performative discussion maybe because you're you're living up to the questions that are being proposed. So they're very different scenarios and it was a big learning experience for me. Now, now in Congo, were you able to compare the two groups you've described to people who hadn't heard the soap opera at all, much less the talk show? Yeah, unfortunately, that was a weakness of the study. We didn't really have a good control group um, of people who, who hadn't been exposed. So you know, it, it may be that, um, once again, listening to the radio soap opera was pretty positive and the, the talk show kind of diminished that positivity. Mm -hmm. it, it's not that, you know, it was just, uh, all a negative effect. It may have been only because it's relative to these people who are listening to this fictional narrative. And what we think of as psychologists is that listening to fictional narratives is really important because it, your guard is is down, right? You're you're thinking about the characters, about their stories. Mm -hmm. It's not as um, immediately personally relevant, which is again the talk show turned that back into, you know, your own personal situation, which um, brings up a lot, many many harsher emotions, and um, it's it's more difficult to let go of our our filters. You know, we talk a lot about you know, partisan filters in our society today. So, you know, um, when it's that personally relevant, we immediately think about counter arguments. We immediately um, gird ourselves. We're, we're a little bit less open to other perspectives. Okay. And there's, uh, well, a couple of things here. I mean, first of all, there is, isn't there like a separate literature arguing that fiction can increase empathy or perspective taking or something? I mean, you hear this made at certainly as a as an historical claim that the advent of the novel had some effect or something i mean now that has to be kind of conjectural but there is is there a literature about the effect of fiction uh, more broadly there is um there have been a couple different arguments that that psychologists have tried to test one is just that reading fiction makes you a more empathic person um there's some evidence to suggest this um uh, others have contested this evidence. I wouldn't say that that's, um, you know, a signed and sealed finding that, that, that that's true. It certainly seems possible. Um, of course, it's also possible that people with a lot of empathy are attracted to fictional narrative. Um, but, um, so, so the experiments about this that try to establish causality have, have said one and another thing. There's also another argument that we've tested, which is that, um, uh, rhetorical arguments, um, are more difficult for us to process than narrative stories. And so mm -hmm. this is a theory that some have pursued about narrative persuasion that, you know, um, tell me the story of Northern Ireland and, and their fight for ind independence in the Middle East. And I'm much better able to think about conflict and, and to acknowledge that there are two sides to every story that um, history can be contested. I'm much better able to think about that um, when it's, um, first of all, not my own story, but it's also a fictional account. Um, and uh, and there is some really good evidence for that, actually. Um, part of it is about um, our tendencies to counter argue, even as we're listening, um, you know, before we've even come to the point where we can say something, we're already preparing counter arguments in our head. That That tendency seems to be relaxed when we're listening to something that we th think of as fictional. Mm -hmm. um, and the other fact that I, I learned from this literature that I'm always fascinated by is that, um, you know, humans don't really draw a very bright line between fiction and reality. So that means that when you're learning something in a fictional narrative, we often sort of confuse the source and, mm -hmm. and remember it as real fact. Mm -hmm. That seems really important if we're trying to convince people of something with a with a fictional story, right? That um, we don't have a, an area of our brain that we reserve for all the made up stuff, and an area of our brain that we reserve for true facts. So um, th that I think that's that's a pretty significant um, idea. That's interesting. Now, as for the. Uh... The fact that discussion didn't do a lot of good, I mean, that that's there's a certain amount of kind of discouraging evidence on that front. Right. I mean, I know in the uh, I think it was in this paper of yours at the beginning, you you do kind of a literature summary. And as I recall, it's like the, the, the work on discussion suggests that, well, if the discussion takes place within the two opposing camps, it can, if anything, have a negative effect. 
Uh, and sadly, technology has put us more and more in that situation, right? Uh, famously now, there's been a lot of discussion of that. But even uh, if, um, you know, when there is discussion across the bounds, it very much depends on the context and, and, and how the thing is structured, right? I mean, for example, there's a certain amount of I, evidence. I, I think there's probably evidence going both ways, but some evidence that if you encounter evidence contrary to your view, evidence that should, in theory, shake your confidence in your view, it can actually have the opposite effect. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's interesting. Most people these days, when they talk about polarization, they mean people who disagree with one another getting more and more extreme. What what psychologists know to be true is that one very powerful form of polarization is a group of people who agree talking to each other. When you get together with a group of people who agree with you and you all feel pretty confident, there is no um, – there is no uh, – more reliable recipe for you all moving out to the extremes of, of your viewpoint. That that's what psychologists call polarization. Now, there's also, of course, the you know reactance in which you sort of bounce against someone else and, and get more extreme. Um, that's actually a little bit less common. What we what we do know though is that um, we're very likely to discount the rationale and, and the facts that um, are mobilized by the other side. So. Um, we have this biased interpretation of someone else's um, rational um, uh, discourse of, you know, here are the facts and this is why I believe what I believe. So um, we're, we're, we're searching for ways to discount those, those facts. And, mm -hmm. and so that's why crosstalk is often unproductive. Um, but, but like you previewed, um, there's a big difference between just unstructured chatting and arguing about our different points of view uh, and um, uh, group discussions where um, people are instructed to debate in a particular way and um, uh, to interact with each other by trying to summarize someone else's point of view before you go ahead and, and make your critique of that point of view and, and so forth. Um, th those can be more productive. Okay. So do you, as you look around at America today, you know, with your knowledge of the various work that's been done about, uh, you know, reducing conflict, are, are you, do you see any signs of hope? Because I, I mean, it, 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 uh, well, first of all, intervention is hard. We're, we're going to talk about another study of yours in a very different kind of context where I think you, uh, you had, uh, results that, people would probably generally find favorable the the study you did in schools but uh i think in a way the current situation in america more closely in in a way the studies we've already talked about are more relevant to the current situation in america um do you uh i don't know how how discouraged are you i'm um i think that uh I should probably leave it to the historians to tell us how our levels of polarization compare to past um, levels of polarization. I doubt that this is the most polarized we've ever been. Um, but I, I think that our technologies and the ways in which we can now disagree with one another um, make that polarization particularly unpleasant and, and destructive. I, I think that the, um, the norms of our discourse have broken down so much um, that disagreement is, is so unpleasant and, and can be experienced as very personally harmful to people. The, um, the attacks and um, the way that those attacks can be coordinated on people and social media and um, this is sort of the disregard for, um, for, for, you know, um, you know, decency in, in some, um, in some examples. So I'm, I'm really discouraged about that. Um, and I'm wondering what combination of technological uh, developments and structures along with um, social role models for um, uh, 
for how we can uh, disagree with each other. I, I'm wondering, um, you know, what combination can can help us? It, it seems pretty. Um, it seems pretty dismal <laughs> uh, from that perspective right now because it seems like it depends on a lot, not just on you know a couple of uh, interventions helping us out. Yeah, and the other question is who who would intervene? I mean, as you've already kind of suggested, the current technology environment makes intervention harder in principle. Yeah. So, uh, and and in fact, you know, I think in a way, um, I mean, if intervention were to come from a non-government source, you would think it would come kind of via Hollywood, broadly speaking. Um, mm. and, and yet, I think uh, it's gotten to the point where people on one side of the kind of tribal divide in America see Hollywood as something that's already trying to propagandize them. Like, yeah. I, I think these are people who, when they see this, you know, some kind of transgender message or something coming out of a movie... That just reinforces their view that they're being preached at by these coastal elites. Right, right. Uh, it's uh, it's challenging. Yeah. When I think about the technologies, I think about the companies that are designing algorithms that determine, you know, where our eyeballs go and, and what is worthy of discussion at this point um, and, and whose contributions we get to see. I think that that is... Um, just as important, if not more important, because our discussion of these, you know, mass media, you know, cultural products is, you know, that's caught up in these, um, these cycles. So, um, so I think about that a lot as well. And, and, um, you know, members of our research team are working on that right now to try to understand, um, you know, uh, there's, there's human feedback into these, um, into these wars over, you know, what information is real and, and what should be considered fake, but humans are feeding back into these algorithms, you know, which are processing our feedback and deciding, you know, what feedback should, mm -hmm. should we weight heavily and what not. So, you know, even the case of, you know, people who are flagging fake news online, for example, um, a postdoc of mine, uh, uh, Nathan Matias is, is studying, you know, um, how our feedback actually, you know, changes what is then, you know, promoted as a, as a real or a fake story. Yeah. Now you're, so you're thinking largely when you say algorithm about social media companies like Twitter and Facebook. Sure. Or Reddit, um, mm -hmm. you know, news aggregators, um, where people are just going to say the politics Reddit to see, you know, what's being promoted on that website. That's something that Matthias is studying because, you know, these are, um, Obviously, they're social websites, but people are mm -hmm. using them for news sources very explicitly. Mm -hmm. Like if you go to, you know, politics, Reddit, like that's what you're going there for. You're not mm -hmm. also going there for, you know, dog costumes. Well, yeah, the uh, and, you know, Twitter is now changing its algorithm to make it more Facebook like. And, and you can already see how when they do that to try to maximize sharing and try to take things that memes that show early signs of virality or virulence, whatever, yes. <laughs> uh, and make them more viral. You can see how that exacerbates the tribalism, because obviously, I, I mean, in this in this context, the tweets uh, and Facebook posts that people immediately start sharing are are usually things that appeal to their emotions. Now, sometimes they're harmless, like dog videos. That's fine, but it, but that's not particularly helping the situation. It's just it's just a fairly you know wholesome wholesome way to get a thrill. The the when you look at you know the uh, the other kinds of things that are emotionally driven, they tend to be uh, tribal. And and Twitter is even as we speak, you can see that they're doing this. That Twitter used to be a straightforward. Yeah. You know, just whoever you're following is who you see in chronological order. Uh, they've started sneaking in things that nobody you follow actually retweeted, but somebody you follow liked. And they'll yeah. use that as an excuse to show you something that's going viral. And you, you just look at these things that are sh suddenly showing up in my feed with 5,000 retweets, and you can see that they're the most unreflectively anti-Trump kind of things. And, mm -hmm. and, and of course... You know, the, the as the algorithm, I assume the reason that I'm not seeing uh, much in the way of the uh, of the 
of the unreflective pro-Trump tweets, even though it could use its algorithm to show them to me, is because it knows that I'm the kind of person who would not retweet them or, or like them. So it, it's just, uh, this is, they are, and I really think this is under discussed. I mean, people talk about fake news and like, oh, well, we'll hire police who will see fake news. You know, no, the problem is deeper. It's the, alg- it's the fundamental algorithms. And yeah. I don't know what you do about it because they're companies and they want to make money and this is the way they make the most money and 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 you got to be a little uh, hesitant to want to get the government involved in regulating uh, companies that <laughs> distribute information. But uh, it's it's like you know Mark yeah. Zuckerberg is not a hero. You know that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ad driven you know um, uh, marketing incentives are never going to help us on these social media sites. Yeah. It's funny. I even, I, I noticed, uh, I saw you, you tweet about this this weekend saying, you know, uh, am I not seeing, you know, what my people I follow are tweeting this weekend? Like it seems a little sparse, like what's happening with the algorithm. And, and I have that sense too, that I'm, I'm not really seeing, um, you know, what I opted in to see. Right. which is you know, um, a really representative swath of, of people and, and what they're saying about various things. So, yeah, I, 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 um, it's, I agree. It's a rightful cause for concern. Um, and, uh, that's why, you know, colleagues, you know, um, who I'm following are doing things like, um, algorithm audits to try to figure out, you know, without knowing the actual, mm. Uh, weights that these companies are are putting on on various people or topics. Um, uh, they're trying to you know feed you know some responses back into the algorithm to see what happens, right? Um, and um, this is a new way of thinking about about justice too, right? Because these algorithms are determining right. so much of of our um, uh, the content that we're. No, looking. I think you could argue that we have a right to know what the algorithms are and even to change them. I mean. <laughs> Uh, you know, again, I'm not sure you want to get the government involved in that, but that would be a fairly innocuous law that they have to at least show us what the algorithm is and give us some degree of control over. I, I mean, th- these things are controlling our consciousness and, mm-hmm. and there's no way out because, you know, Facebook, once it has once everybody's on Facebook, there is no alternative social network like that. And it's the same with Twitter. And, uh, you know, so anyway, that's that's today's sermon. So. We we uh, the, um, I want to talk about the other study. We we don't have a ton of time left, but but let me um, uh, it's super ambitious and interesting. And l- let me tell you what uh, my my own uh, thirty second summary of it is, and then you can tell me what I got wrong. But basically, uh, you went into a bunch of schools. Uh, well, some schools you intervened and some you didn't, but you wanted to change attitudes uh I, and you want you wanted to change the actual level of conflict ideally right mm-hmm. the, the number of conflicts that get reported to the to the principal um mm-hmm. and you figured that well uh you know some people well first of all you figured you know we to some extent absorb our norms from our peers from looking students look at what other students are doing and uh, by way of figuring out what they think is okay and some people are more influential than others as, I don't know if role models is a technically correct term, but, but, but some people are more influential than others. So you, you, you went through, and by asking people like who they spend time with or whatever the exact question was, you kind of got a sense of the overall social networks and which people had an inordinate number of, con- of people in their networks kind of, but that was, was that the big uh, criterion? And, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, then, and then you got these people together and actually uh, kind of coach them about how they could, I guess, make a positive difference and then release them into the wild, so to speak. Yeah. And, uh, and I was, and there were positive results in terms of conflict reduction, right? Right, right. Yeah, so this is maybe, you know, this is maybe where we should end if we want to leave people with a, a slightly more positive outlook um, because what we were looking for in this study um, was, you know, the bottom up um, uh, question about how things become normal. Um, you know, cause we can think about mass media and governments 
um, you know, issuing decisions or releasing programs onto us that, you know, change our minds about what's, what's typical in our society. But, um, we're also constantly forming our impressions by, by watching our peers, um, whether we're watching them react to the government or react to the mass media, but also just what they decide to do in their everyday lives. Um, and we're not obviously just looking at everybody and taking this unweighted average, like, okay, we're generally doing this. We're looking at, you know, norm entrepreneurs, who are the people who seem to really have this inside track on, uh, on our communities. And, um, they aren't always the most popular people, um, but they're the most watched people. And so we were using these social network measurement techniques to try to figure out, you know, who those people are. Um, and, you know, you said it very well. It was just, we asked people, you know, um, who they were choosing to spend time with. We're just looking to see who's getting the most eyeballs in any community. So, um, our strategy with them was to really act as their campaign managers. We didn't want to give them a just say no to conflict manual. We weren't going to sort of Nancy Reagan this. This was uh, a, an effort to to help them use their authentic um, read of the community to say, look, what do you think makes people really uncomfortable to come to school? Um, you get to decide what issue you'd like to work on. And, and we had to just be okay with you know, if we were working at a particular school and no, none of the students decided to say anything about sexual harassment, um, that's just the way it was going to be. We weren't going to force them into so that. You let them define the kinds of conflict that the intervention was about. That's right. I mean, we, we narrowed it into talking about peer conflict um, and said, you know, so what are the behaviors that, that you wish weren't as frequent? And they identified things, you know, like mm -hmm. Um, sexual harassment, although I should say, you know, um, it was more likely that that young women would talk about that and that it would come up later in the program. No one ever led with that. That wasn't sort of the um, most comfortable thing for them to talk about. But um, people talked a lot about uh, excluding uh, other students. So having like very um, hierarchical, rigid, uh, like seating arrangements, uh, at lunch and in other spaces in the school where people felt um, you know, less than free to, to, um, to, you know, socialize with each other, um, using slurs and, and, um, and other kinds of labels for each other, like gay as a, as a bad word and things like that. Um, so they identified their own, um, issues that they wanted to work on. And then, and then, you know, we sort of harnessed social media and social networks. We said, make public statements about this, be the face of, you know, this particular stance you want to take. Um, some of these students were uh, offenders. You know, they had used these words before, participated in these systems. Um, the point was not to get the most angelic, you know, student leaders. It was to get people who were just, um, you know, these these norm entrepreneurs. And, uh, and so uh, what we observed was that the more of those types of students who did this in a school, we randomly sort of increased the number of students who were involved in these efforts, um, the more uh, actual behavioral conflict at the school went down. Um, we also observed this concurrent change in the way people perceive norms at their school. Um, so again, it was this idea that we all have values and personal beliefs. Um, those are formed over a long period of time, and they probably take a long time to change. And so... Um, the strategy that we've taken is to not really try to tackle that head on. You, know, you can have your own beliefs and your own um, uh, values. Um, what we want to convince you of is that others in your community think that um, this is the way to be. <laughs> this is the way we're going to act. Right. And so yeah. within a certain bandwidth, you know, you can be yourself, but um, – trying to establish new social rules about, you know, what, what is unthinkable, right? Um, a while ago, it was not unthinkable to use the most atrocious um, slurs against LGBT young people. I think that's becoming less thinkable in a lot of schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, not all, but, but in, in some. And, and so, um, and so that's the idea here. And, and, Obviously, social norms can change back. That's what everyone's talking about in the United States right now. Um, they're not written down. And so social processes mean that they can shift over time. Um, but, uh, but they're more dynamic and they can shift more quickly than people's 
you know, long held personal ideologies and beliefs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting what you said about having them define the problem, because when I heard about uh, the success of this approach, I was kind of surprised because I thought the intervention, the part where you get the kind of community leaders or whatever, you, you know, the influencers together and turn them into kind of uh, more self-conscious leaders, I thought that would be super delicate because in my experience from high, if I recall high school correctly, if some adult told you what they thought you should be doing, you would just do the opposite. And it, and it, yeah. and, and so I can see how that, uh, that was probably a very valuable way to start. And then did you, did you also give them a big role in deciding like what kinds of things they would do to, uh, to improve the situation? Yeah, I mean, we really tried to uh, just to act as campaign managers. We didn't suggest any um, strategies um, uh, in part because we thought it's just it's never going to be contemporary with what's working at their school. And mm -hmm. and it, it really brought it home to us. I mean, we were working in, in 56 different schools and, you know, we were learning so much, uh, you know, the vocabulary alone <laughs> for like how to talk about certain issues um, uh, was rich and inaccessible to us until we started really spending a lot of time with these young people. But it changed from school to school. There were some commonalities, but not a lot. So um, so we didn't even try. Um, our model was really that, you know, students are savvy social perceivers and operators and if they have a goal of trying to reduce conflict, they know how to get there. Um, it, it's just that we are trying to orient them on that goal uh, more frequently and, um, and, and to make those goals more salient and uh, the rules of, of what's acceptable um, as you maintain your reputation, as you defend your reputation, um, to, to make certain ways of doing that off the table. Mm -hmm. And were there particular approaches that the students came up with that are particularly memorable or, or were particularly effective or, or just, um, or, or just particularly weird? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I think that one, um, one event that I'll remember is um, one of our, our team members who was working in a particular school was always worried about this one particular young man on the on the um, on the team. You know, he he didn't really seem that invested in it. He seemed pretty invested in his reputation. And 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 so she was a little bit worried about, you know, what was he going to say to other students? And we had launched this big day long campaign for the team to go out and get people to sign petitions and hand out wristbands and raise awareness of this, this campaign. And, um, what she noticed was that one of the, the other students doing this, who was very shy, was getting made fun of by a table of, of students as she was trying to get them to sign a petition or something like that. I don't quite remember. And that this kid actually went over and, and, um, and, and started making fun of them to try to get them to, mm. to, to lay off of her. And so it was just really interesting because it really spoke to what we were saying. Like, we don't expect any of them to turn into these, you know, um, you know, very disciplined angels. Um, you know, the point of adolescence is to like wrestle with each other and figure out who you are. And the conflict is part of that. But, um, but he was he was using, you know, and he, and he wasn't, you know, really um, tearing into them, but he was letting them know, like, that's out of bounds. And mm -hmm. I'm going to spend a little bit of my social capital to, to let you know that. And, um, and and we were all just like really impressed and surprised and excited that he did that. He really waited until like the last minute to do it, too, uh, in terms of I think it was at the end of the school year. But um, he got into it. And so then in the end, you did see a decline. What are some of the kinds of conflict? Did you categorize them? I mean, the, uh, specific kinds of conflict that there was a decline in the reported uh, incidences of? It was any conflict that was between two students that was serious enough to get reported and written down mm -hmm. at the school. So it ranged from like getting a detention for um, saying something really rude about someone else's parents or something like that to um, to getting suspended or expelled for physical fighting. Mm -hmm. So um 
all told, all put together, whenever someone was written up essentially for pure conflict, um, those incidents went down in the places where we were working um, to a significant extent. And that really depended on how many of those norm entrepreneurs, those people who got a lot of attention, joined the joined the group. Okay. Uh, final little uh, tangent. Um, on uh, I, a thing you wrote, I think maybe it was one of these review things for like some handbook of something or something. It's on your website. And we'll give people the URL to your website. But yeah. you're summarizing uh, findings about how to foster harmony across uh, kind of tribal lines, so to speak. The um, And there are a couple of things. First of all, there's a lot of evidence that, that the... the uh, criteria that define the tribe can be almost anything. It's like you can just put purple shirts on one group and it almost, you don't have to do that much else before they start thinking of themselves uh, as a tribe. Then, you know, the other side of the coin is, well, once there is antagonism, how do you bring uh, groups together? You know, it turns out that sadly, conflict, uh, contact itself is not necessarily enough. It depends on what the context of the contact is. And, and it, it seemed to me that one, <clears throat> one uh, common strand in terms of what makes for effective contact was the perception that there is something non-zero sum about the dynamic. In other words, they're pursuing a common goal or they're mm-hmm. eligible for a reward if they work together or, uh, yeah. or, the, or maybe they just find out that, oh, they're all part of this larger group. Uh, and, and I mean, this is relevant because the other thing that's very different, uh, you know, today from the America of my youth is this, that was the cold war. We had a common enemy and that's one way to feel that you're in a non-zero sum situation with people in your country. And that is also, I mean, I guess there is a perception that terrorism is, a, is, 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 is a threat, but it's not nearly a, the kind of monolithic you know, in terms of both magnitude and uh yeah so i don't know this is just a, um, a, a, a did i get that right about the findings well i i would say that um one way in which i'm a little bit of out of step with some of my colleagues in psychology is that i think that we've come to premature conclusions about the value of intergroup contact and and so there's um you were uh really helpfully um, explaining this theory that, you know, it's not just contact. If you also have cooperative contact that is, you know, legitimized by authority that has a common goal, et cetera, like that's when it's productive. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the first question is just how often is that actually feasible in, in society, um, to set up this, this so-called ideal contact. And then second, um, you know, in reviewing the literature, um, I think that the policy implications are pretty weak. We, we don't have a lot of really, great studies showing that this is, has happened when we've tried to do it. So um, I, I think that your insight, though, is very interesting. I mean, the same the same theorist, this guy named uh, Gordon Allport, who was um, theorizing about the ideal forms of contact, was also the one who said, but you know what the most powerful thing is, is a common en- enemy. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so psychologists, as a rule, don't generally go around trying to whip up a common enemy as a you know, sort of policy uh, intervention, but I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's too far a cry to say, you know, different generations have different um, uh, perceptions of, of partisanship and then also um, how much uh, a partisan identity matters in the greater context and how often they think about the, the greater context of, um, you know, the U.S. and the world or um, Democrats and Republicans and so forth. Um, so anyway, I, I think the main takeaway for me is that, um, we don't have a lot of really tried and true ways of reducing conflict. I, I think that this is still an emerging science of trying to figure out what are the regularities in, um, in trying to produce a, a more peaceful, more tolerant, um, group of people and, and to reduce hostilities. Um, and so figuring out what's politically feasible is, is the, you know, it's a big frontier. Yeah. We agree on that. Uh, well, thank you, Betsy, for taking the time. Really appreciate it. So where can people find your stuff? So you've got your, your website, your personal 
I think it's uh, what is it? Uh, is what what is the exact URL? Yeah, it's BetsyLevyPollock.com. And that's and just one word. All one word. L e v y p a l u c k. Exactly. And if you also Google my name, it's probably one of the first things to uh, to pop up. And we've pasted all of our. Um, you know, links to our papers up there and it has a description of different projects. And um, yeah, it's, um, it would be great. I'm, I'm always interested in, in what people think. And, you know, the whole idea of our research is to really try to have a back and forth between the public and our, our, um, our research processes, because we're constantly, you know, interacting and, and collaborating with people outside of academia. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and what about like, is there a Twitter handle or any anywhere else you, you'd like people to find you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at Betsy Levy P. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I tweet a lot about, you know, these issues and um, try to make people aware of other studies that are, are coming out about these types of things. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, thank you so much. And uh, thanks again for, uh, well, I mean, congratulations again uh, on uh, the MacArthur Award. Uh, being uh, officially a genius. Uh, has the thrill worn off? I guess, I think psychological theory would, would, would predict that it just about is wearing off now, but I don't know. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, the, the hedonic treadmill uh, gets you every time. Uh, but uh, um, the, the term genius was old the first day it happened. I guess you, you've been getting a lot of... Basically. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I probably wasn't the first to kind of try to try to milk that for as much as I could. I, I it's, uh, I'll stop now. Okay. Well, there, thank you. Th- downsides. Yeah. Oh, well. Except for that one. I, I'll, but... I'll, I'll bet on balance. You can live with it. Um, yes. okay. Well, thanks. Thanks again and keep up the good work. Thanks so much. This is really a pleasure to talk to you.